Good evening and welcome here tonight to the third in our panels, our 5 by 15 panels, which are co-curated with Q, supported by Rathbones. And I'm really thrilled to be here tonight with our panel of speakers who you're going to meet in a few minutes. Last time we were all together, we talked about regeneration and the future, and in particular about the younger generation. We talked about how it's really important to have access to the natural world and to get out there into nature, especially in the midst of the environmental crisis, so that people began to understand how important nature was and to understand all of its benefits. But what do we mean by that? I mean, I hear this a lot, nature and health, nature equals health, health equals nature. But what are the connections between nature and us as living beings? What are the connections, for instance, between the soil and the food we grow and our digestive system? Can being outdoors not just kind of make you feel better and make you feel more cheery, but actually is there scientific evidence that it is better for the way we function, for the chemistry of our body? In which case, what is it exactly? What's great about being involved with Q and doing work with them is that they bring us, and so do our speakers, the cutting edge of a lot of this new science. And it really is new. I've learned such a lot from working on this event. Did you know, for instance, that many herbal remedies, which are often, I mean, literally sneezed at, are often really complex mixtures of many, many chemical compounds. And evidence for their effectiveness does exist. And a bit more ominously, stuff that you might pick up in the health shop that's said to be ginseng could in fact be one of 23 different plants. That's info from Q. So we're in luck here tonight. But we're going to set some records here tonight with our, as I say, stellar panel. As usual, we're going to have some short opening remarks from all of them. And then we're going to have a discussion. And then we're going to come over to you for your questions. So do start right now putting them into the chat box, the Q&A the box, and I'll come to them when I can. Um, many of them have written books and the details of all their books will be in the chat box tonight. So do have a look. And having read um, quite a few of these books, I cannot recommend them more. So the first people we're going to have, I say people advisedly, because this is the first time we've had a double act in that a husband and wife, David Montgomery and Anne Bilkey, are going to be talking together. And they're, in fact, authors of four quite extraordinary books about soil, about soil health, about the evolution of soil, and, in fact, about how, in their book, The Hidden Half of Nature, about our insides and the soil. It's really fascinating. They are going to do an extraordinary feat and they're going to run us through the main findings of their books in about seven minutes. Um, David and Anne are joining us from North Seattle, where he is a professor at the University of Washington, and the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation, a Genius Award. Anne is the science writer and public speaker. And I've heard her speak and she's absolutely wonderful and her books are great. So with no more ado, I'm going to hand over to them and I can tell you all you're in for a treat this evening. Anne and David, thank you. Thank you, Rosie, and thank you for everyone for being here. It's a pleasure uh, to be talking to you from around the world. We are going to try and give you the, the highlights of four books that we've written over the next couple minutes. So let me get right into sharing my screen here, and we'll, we'll get into it. Um, Anne is a biologist. I'm a geologist. We've spent a lot of time in the last 10 years or so thinking about the connections between soil and human societies. And we started out by looking at the broad picture, kind of the way you might expect a geologist to look at that. And that's in this book, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, that I wrote back in 2007. And, you know, the three main takeaways that we'd like to share with you in terms of what this book got into, other than, you know, a geologist's view of how to look at the soil, is that societies that don't take care of their soil don't last. There's a very long uh, and um, intricate a uh, historical record of societies that uh, literally plowed through their natural endowment of fertile soils, uh, much to their descendants continuing detriment. Um, soil erosion, in fact, has um, and soil degradation have limited the lifespan of past societies. That's the key argument that I made in DIRT. And there's two real f uh, fundamental pieces to soil degradation. One is the loss of the soil itself, soil erosion. The other one is the degradation of the natural fertility of the soil, and that translates into degrading soil organic matter and degrading soil life, the communities of life in the soil that Anne's going to tell you a lot more about, because 
that came up in researching later books. Um, the other aspect I wanted to share about the dirt, um, the book, is that soil erosion is not just ancient history. So far, humanity has degraded about a third of the world's potentially agricultural land to the extent that it's not really viable for intensive agriculture. And there's a UN report from a few years ago that projected that over the course of this century, uh, continuing with business as usual with conventional agriculture, we would degrade roughly another third of the world's capacity to feed itself through soil loss and soil degradation. Uh, that's not sustainable. Now, Dirt was essentially a backwards looking book that elucidated, elucidated problems with how we've treated the land in the past. And Growing a Revolution, uh, the book that I wrote uh, after writing Dirt, is more what I like to think of as the optimistic sequel to Dirt, because it turns out that regenerative farming practices can actually restore soil fertility remarkably fast. Now, remember, I'm a geologist, so when I say remarkably fast, I don't mean by snapping your fingers, but it's kind of like that if you think about time the way a geologist does. Um, Soils can be restored in years to decades, not centuries to millennia. In other words, it's very viable to rebuild the health and fertility of the degraded land around the world to help feed the world of tomorrow. And it turns out that farming and ranching practices that are, uh, in, that are um, regenerative, that actually build soil health, that regenerate soil fertility, could put a lot of carbon back in the ground. There's a lot of controversy about just how much carbon agriculture could put back in the ground. But based on the farms I've visited around the world and the data that we've looked at, I'm very confident that a lot of carbon could be put in the ground and that we ought to be running the experiment because there's lots of side benefits that would come from it that would benefit biodiversity, human health, and, and um, farm profitability even, and not just, uh, not just the climate. What are the secrets to uh, regenerative farming? Um, in terms, I visited farms around the world that had uh, restored their uh, soils on degraded farmland, and I came up with a simple numeric, uh, mnemonic of ditch the plow, cover up, and grow diversity. Uh, don't disturb the soil, so minimum tillage uh, or, or no-till farming, uh, planting cover crops, and growing a diversity of crops. In other words, these practices are just about the exact opposite of what we've been teaching in conventional agriculture for the last hundred years. And then there's the question of uh, reintegrating animal husbandry into cropping operations, as we've learned that um, animal agriculture can actually help accelerate rebuilding soil fertility, but it has to be done right and very differently than it's being done today on a global scale. So at this point, those are the key takeaway points from Dirt and Growing a Revolution, and I'm going to turn it over to Anne for uh, the uh, second half of the 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 books that we've written. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. We're just going to continue on here. So The Hidden Half of Nature, this definitely was a book for David and I where you think you know things, but then you're presented with information and we're doing all of this research and we are having to learn how to see all over again and in this case see things that are invisible that is basically the story behind the hidden half of nature and not only that but it turns out that the, the microbial world and microbiomes in particular are really running the show in the soil in our bodies in plants and in animals and contrast sort of that general picture with how we have tended to see the microbial world over time. Uh, most of the time, and COVID is a very present day reminder of all this, we've seen the microbial world as generally pathogens, bad actors, uh, life forms that we should be eradicating. And But we have big brains, people, right? We can hold two opposing thoughts in our minds at the same time. And so it is true on the one hand that there are some pretty dread pathogens coming out of the microbial world. But on the other hand, we know that we need microbiomes in our bodies and in the soil because they are, in a sense, in essence, they, we have trillions of helpers out there. And this is pretty recent science. We didn't know about this 50 years ago, but <clears throat> Whatever kind of a host organism is out there, their microbiome is basically helping them do three main things, all of which are needed to thrive and survive. They're helping their hosts get nutrients. They're normalizing immune responses. They're, they're helping their host defend effectively 
against pathogens and also important, especially in our crops these days, they're helping cope with stress, things like drought, things like freezes. So really the hidden half of nature, the way I think about it these days is that it is one of the biggest mutual aid projects in the history of life. And there is a lot that two of humanity's greatest endeavors can really take away from microbiomes. Um, these two great endeavors, of course, agriculture is one, practices of agriculture, and also the practice of medicine. And so this led to our latest book, What Your Food Ate. And it really was a process of asking questions. So Dave just ran you through, you know, the plight and the problem with soil, the fact that there are practices that are better for the soil. And so this led us to ask, what does this all mean then for the quality of our food? Do farming practices matter? Now, I expected an audience like this will tell me, of course they matter. I hope you're saying that. All right. And the reason is that practices in agriculture affect groups of nutrients and compounds. We call them the Fab Four. The practices affect their levels in crops and in animals, and so therefore in the foods that we eat. And so what are these Fab Four? They're phytochemicals. They are micronutrients, things, minerals like zinc or iron. You don't need very much of them, but they do an awful lot of things in our body, so they're really important. And for animals, there's certain fats that we want to have in our animal foods. And then even there are metabolites that microbiomes are making that are part of the human diet, and we want them, we want them in there. And so really this book was about making connections because when we see that what we do to the soil either does or does not suffuse plant and animal foods with the kinds of nutrients and compounds that they're supposed to have, then we begin to see these links between the health of the soil, the health of our crops, our animals, and ultimately us. And I think, you know, really what the four books boil, boil down to, or maybe they're boiling up to, depending on how you think about it, is this. Ask yourselves, when it comes at least to agriculture, are the practices out there, are they good for the land? Because if so, then they are good for us too. All right, thanks, and we'll see you again during the question period. Thank you so much. That was that was simply great. I can't believe how much info you've got into such a short space of time. And of course, I've got lots of questions like, what the hell are our supermarket vegetables like? Which I'll probably ask you right away. Um, and anyway, so I'm now going to turn to our next speaker, who is Kathy Willis, who indeed was the science director at Kew before she went off to run an Oxford college and become an extremely distinguished professor of biodiversity at Oxford. She's also a crossbench peer and she knows an incredible amount about biodiversity. And in fact, she while she has written a number of books, she has a new book coming out, which looks into some of the stuff she's going to be talking about now, which is um, what, how does how does nature actually communicate with us through our bodies? And how much difference does it make to us? Can we quantify this? And I suppose from my point of view, and we will hopefully get to this in the questions, can we legislate to make this happen, to make our lives better? So, Cathy, over to you, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Let me just see if I can share my screen. Um, right. Okay, can you see that? Rosie, can you see the screen okay? So, um, the, the, what I'm come, I, I've completely following on from the the talk before. Actually, I think there's a lot of overlap in what we're discussing. But this whole question of which parts of nature should we conserve and restore to maximise the health and well-being benefits that we get from nature, and um, I'm going to make sure I can, because if we look at the, we I think broadly we all now 
and most people now agree there is a very strong relationship coming through between green spaces and good health and it's recognized both nationally and internationally so if we look for example the um, conference of parties the biodiversity conference last december december 2022 the target 16 was to significantly increase the area and access um, to green space in urban areas to improve, improve human health and well-being. We've also got the UK policies coming through that public should be able to access green space or water, woodlands, wetlands, parks and rivers within a 15 minute walk of their home. So this all sounds very good. We are absolutely, I think, as a well, globally starting to understand green space is important for human health and well-being. But what sort of green space are we talking about within 15 minutes of our homes? What's best for the health and well-being? So if I walk from 15 minutes from where I am right now in Oxford, I've got the Oxford Botanic Gardens and I used to have the Kew Gardens outside my window. Is that the best sort of space? Or is it this? This is my dog on the football pitch for scale. That's another 15 minute walk from my home. Or there's the Oxford University Parks. So that's another 15 minute, which is a mixture of trees and football pitches and cricket pitches. Or there's the Cutislow Community Forest, which one down on the far um, right hand uh, corner of the screen. Or finally, we've got uh, the Oxford Arboretum with many trees. So is there, are there particular aspects of this green space that we should be looking to create in order to maximise the, the um, well-being benefits, the health and well-being benefits from it? Now, what we do know, and I've done the last three years researching into this to write this book, is that there are a number of different interactions that happen to us physiologically and psychologically, direct interactions when we interact with different aspects of nature and our, particularly our senses interact. So we've got, I call them green senses, but this smell from certain plants can directly influence biochemical pathways in our body. Look at different shapes and sizes and densities of vegetation affects brainwave activity. Sound leads to physiological calming touch when we stroke different uh, wooden surfaces we get very different responses in our heart rate variability but there's no taste but what there is and this very much links to the previous talk is it's actually it's the environmental microbiome we can't see smell hear touch it and yet those microbes around us do seem to be having an incredible direct interaction with our bodies and I'll say that because, um, and I just want to pick up on this this paper, which is actually published um, right in 2011, a long time ago, which is called the Environmental Microbiome Hypothesis. And in here, this team from Finland hypothesized that because biodiverse environments are, are naturally good in, um, in environmental microbes, if we spend time in them, it will increase the diversity of microbiome, of these microbiota in our bodies, and we'll have this larger and more diverse arsenal of microbiota on our skin, and that moves into our gut. And this will protect us from various health conditions, particularly autoimmune conditions. So what they did show was a relationship between the biodiversity of land types and the biodiversity, the microbiodiversity of people, the micro, microbial diversity that people have on their skin when they're in these environments. Now, a lot of people missed this paper, I believe, and I certainly did. But more recently, in the last couple of years, there's some, there's some more excellent work going on in Finland. And this time, they've started to look at what happens when we interact with a more biodiverse micro, bio, environmental microbiome. So what they did in this experiment is that they looked at 75, uh, 79 young children who spend a majority of their time either playing in, in this soil or on this sort of matting. And in this one, they actually physically enriched the sand in one sand pit with, uh, it was actually soil from the, bio, um, the boreal forest. And they did this for 28 days. So the children naturally played in these two different environments. So sort of a very uh, sort of sterile environment or sterile sand, microbial, um, a very diverse sand. And then they measured the their microbial communities in their on their skin and in their in their stools on days 0, 14 and 28. And they also looked at their bloods. What's going on in the bloods? Are they seeing any markers or changes in markers as a result of being in these two very different environments? So what did they show? So what they found very clearly 
and I'll, I'll come to this one in a minute. The children that played in a microbially in the microbially diverse soil had a really big shift in their skin and their gut microbial diversity of 28 days. The what effectively happened was the children's gut and skin adopted the good microbial biodiversity that they had that was in the sand. But even more important than that, this triggered processes within the body and this some of the ones that were being mentioned in the previous talk and here we can see this is the amount of change in good t cells so t cells are really important um they they enhance the immune system functioning this is what happens this is the placebo no change this is the this is the change in the children's blood t cells after 28 days of just playing in this uh, microbially diverse sand pit but the question is, does that happen with adults? And I love this study. I've got three studies and it's my second one. I love this study because this is something we could all do. So what they do, they put a green wall in an office and it's, it's an active green wall. So the, it sucks the air out from the room, passes over the vegetation and then um, it, the vegetation takes up the pollutants. And what they did, they had participants that sat in an office that had the green wall and participants who sat in office with no green wall. And again, they did skin, skin swabs and blood samples on 0-14 and 28 days. So this is what happened to their skin. So if you look on here, I can't see. So the experimental is the blue bar and the control is the orange. So after day 14 and 28, what you can see happening here is you get a really, really big increase in lactobacillus on the skin, which is one of those um, bacterial communities that's very good for good skin. So yet again, the humans are adopting the environmental microbiome around them. But even more important, I think, from this was that you had a statistically significant lowering of markers in the blood known to be associated with causing inflammation and associated inflammatory diseases. So enhancing the microbiome is also enhancing their, their um, immune system. So what sort of green space then should we be accessing? We're thinking about what does green space look like in cities or beyond cities in order to get this? Should I be walking my dog on the football pitch or the Cutterslow Community um, Orchard? And this was a lovely study done again very recently in an urban park in Adelaide. And they went across the park and effectively they measured the microbial communities by putting a big tall stick and they put agar gel plates at different levels and they collected the bacterial communities at these different levels. So they looked at both the vertical and the horizontal stratification of microbial communities. And what they found is the more biodiverse the community became, uh, vegetation, the higher the microbial diversity as well. The two were really closely linked. There was a linear relationship. But also they found the more biodiverse the environment became, the higher the vertical stratification of the microbial communities. Now, why is this important? Well, when you're getting up to one, one and a half meters, of course, that's close to your face. That's when you'll start to really ingest some of these things. What they found with this monodominant football pitch is, in fact, there was very, very little stratification. And even worse than that, they found very, very low levels of microbial diversity. And they found quite a few pathogenic bacteria there or things that cause um, Ill sickness in us. And they, they think that's because it's so heavily sprayed with fertilizers and chemical um, chemicals on that football pitch. So my very last slide then is, are there, you know, what sort of green space within 15 minutes walking distance is best? Just going back to Oxford. Well, I would say yes, definitely botanic gardens. No, not the football pitch, probably not the university parks. And yes, to these other two, but again, very much linking back to the previous talk about soils and something we can't see, smell, taste, touch, but is around us all the time. Cathy, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, that's so interesting in terms of what we should do about urban planning and, you know, well, urban planning. We can come back to that, hopefully, when we've got some question time. Um, our next speaker is Marshall Farrell, who is a therapist, a writer, as well as being an amateur gardener, although I suspect her garden is absolutely fantastic. Her, her debut memoir, Uprooting, won the very prestigious Nan Shepherd Prize for nature writing. Uh, I read today a really fabulous article she'd written in The Guardian about why she, when she had children, she decided she wanted to move out of an urban area into the countryside. And I hope that's what she's going to be telling us now. So over to you for your five minutes. Thank you very much for being with us, Marshall. 
Thank you so much, Rosie. And it's so fascinating to hear what the other speakers have been talking about already. As for my own perspective on this, you're right, as a psychotherapist, I am coming at this from a relational lens and also through a personal story. You know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about relationships, but um, I began to realize that that was pretty much entirely within the human realm. You know, that all of the thinking and teaching about relationships that I'd experienced had only ever really been about relationships with other people and never about relationship with place, with the kind of outer landscape and its creatures that hold our inner landscapes. And I got really curious about this because there was already quite powerful evidence within psychiatry itself that the environment is a really profound factor in shaping our risk to really quite severe mental illness. And the thing that caught my interest was the hugely elevated risk that British born people of black Caribbean heritage have of developing schizophrenia. Um, I am from the Caribbean. I was born and brought up in Trinidad and Tobago. And I first learned about this study sort of over 15 years ago when the figure cited was a risk nine times higher than white British populations and also nine times higher than Caribbean populations. And even though schizophrenia is usually an illness with a really strong genetic component, the research at the time seemed to show that in this case, there wasn't so much of a genetic link, but rather it was mainly thought to be down to the environment, or in other words, relationship with place. And those early studies identified living in cities as being a particularly key risk factor. So it's no surprise that when I eventually came to have children of my own, who are British born people of black Caribbean heritage and life presented us with a sudden opportunity to move to the countryside. We took it despite my misgivings about being the only black woman in the village, but we moved just before the pandemic. And I found myself without really many ties to the people in the community as yet and cut off from them by lockdown, almost forced into a really intimate relationship with place, with this kind of English country garden that we were suddenly locked within. And through this intimacy, I had the really personal experience of just how profoundly life-altering relationship with place can be, and how much our external, relation, our external landscape can hold our internal one. And my relationship with the garden came to feel very akin to the therapeutic relationship and how it feels to be held by another mind in the therapy room. It felt as though the garden was carrying out a process akin to one that we call alpha function, where it was taking my sort of really overwhelming feelings, for which I barely had words in that really kind of terrifying, uncertain time of the pandemic. And through being with the space, coherent narratives by which I could make sense of my thoughts and understand my experiences emerged. And this is so very like the experience of what happens in therapy that I found it quite mind blowing that a place could provide that for us, not just a person. And in following my curiosity about this kind of deep sense of relationship in the garden, it led me to begin to explore the links and connections between the places that I had been in relationship with, so the Caribbean gardens of my childhood and now this English garden of my children's childhood. And that really brought home for me how profoundly interlinked these places are and how interconnected we are with these places. Now we ask ourselves the question, how is nature good for us? Forgetting, I think, that we are a part of nature. And I think if we reframe the question to say that, you know, as mammalian animals who have lost meaningful relationship with our habitats, we are ailing. And in many ways, I think our current interlinked crises of climate, biodiversity, physical and mental ill health really illustrate that in many ways, our species has gone mad. <laughs> We're making so many decisions on a societal level that are terrible for our well-being which is quite unnatural if you look at other species operating in the world. And so this has really showed for me how much there is that connects us all in this and how much our collective healing of our psyches and of the environment around us is very profoundly intertwined. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of the discussion this evening and learning from the other speakers and their perspectives on this as well. Thank you so much, Marshall. That was that was just lovely. And I completely understand um, what you mean about the sense of place. And that is that's a very interesting other aspect to bring into 
the whole discussion. Um, our final speaker tonight is is from Kew. In fact, she is the interim director of Kew at Wakehurst. Lorraine Le, Le Courtois is has been had a fantastic career. She's worked at the Globe, at Shakespeare's Globe, and she has done lots of big projects of inland transformations of landscapes and now she's been at Wakehurst for seven years and the wonderful slide in the background is indeed of an extraordinary tree which you can see there and so she's going to she in fact is still running the research project that Kathy Willis when she was at Q pretty much set up so we're longing to hear from what the work that you do and how it's um taking this agenda forward so Lorraine over to you. Oh, thank you, Rosie. So hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Lorraine and I'm the interim director at Wakehurst, which is Kew's Wild Botanic Garden in Sussex and home to the Millennium Seed Bank. Um, as well as being a leading visitor destination, Wakehurst is a 525 acre living laboratory where our Nature Unlocked Science programme is based. Nature Unlocked is researching the value of UK biodiversity to inform nature based solutions to critical challenges such as climate change and food security. And Nature Unlocks research primarily focuses in four areas. So carbon. Now, carbon's not my area, um, but the team are looking in real detail at above and below ground carbon storage and gas flux. Um, and I would love to talk to Anne and David in much more detail about their work on soil. Um, in this area of research, we're digging to understand the role that mycorrhizal fungi play in carbon storage and using a range of techniques to look at DNA within soil samples and measure not only the carbon, but also other factors that can affect fungi in their contribution to the ecosystem. Uh, the second pillar is pollination, uh, studying the behaviours of wild bees, what plants they're visiting and the wider role that pollinators play in ecosystem function. As a wild botanic garden, our landscape offers a variety of non-native species. And our research has shown that these species are important for UK pollinators as they flower later than native meadows and extend nectar resource beyond a typical season. Uh, we're doing some uh, work in hydrology, particularly around wet woodlands. Um, and I have the privilege of leading the wellbeing strand of our work, focus focusing on nature connectedness. So actually much like we've just been hearing, Nature connectedness captures the relationship between people and the rest of nature. It's a measurable psychological construct that moves beyond mere contact with nature, but to an individual's sense of their relationship with the natural world. And specifically at Wakehurst, we're looking at the impact of biodiversity on our nature connectedness. So we've run a couple of studies. Um, the one that I'm just gonna mention now was working with Royal Holloway University London. And we carried out research with 1200 school children comparing the impact of nature connectedness across three different habitat areas, uh, woodlands, wetlands, and meadows. So 36 groups of children between seven, ages seven and 13 were taken on a nature experience walk to one of these three locations. Um, and on their walk, they, uh, were led by a group leader who modeled much of the behaviors that Kathy Willis was just talking about, engaging with nature through their senses, asking what they notice, what they see, what they hear, feel, smell, and encouraging children to touch things, kind of uh, feel them really get down and, and look and close their eyes and listen, um, each stopping at four locations. And once they'd reached their habitat location, children were asked to quietly walk and see what they noticed using the skills that had been demonstrated on the way. So during the study, we saw that older children had much less change in their nature connection after their visit compared to the younger children. Children who had lower pre-visit scores, so were not so connected to nature pre-visit, were likely to experience much more positive connections to nature post-walk. And children who had higher well-being scores pre-visit and children whose well-being had had greater change during their visit were much more likely to have a positive connection to nature. And connection to nature was impacted by the habitat with meadows showing within these groups the highest connection to nature. So this is just a snapshot of some of our results and we are carrying out a lot more further studies. We're currently working with around 300 adults who will be returning to Wakehurst across multiple visits. And through this research, we're looking at what those adults notice in nature, how it impacts their nature connectedness and how they respond to it emotionally as well. So why is nature connectedness important? And I think we've just heard this, I feel like I'm kind of repeating it, but people who are more connected to nature are usually happier in life. They're more likely to report feeling their lives are worthwhile and nature can create, can generate many positive emotions such as calmness, joy, creativity, and it can facilitate concentration. 
Nature Connection is also associated with lower levels of poor mental health, particularly lower depression and anxiety. And perhaps not surprisingly, people with strong nature connectedness are much more likely to show pro-environmental behaviours. So the cities have come up, urban living has come up. According to the World Bank, 56% of the world's population, that's 44 billion people now live in cities. And here in the UK, 90% of the UK population is in urban environments and children growing up in urban environments are much less likely to enjoy the natural environment and have significantly less contact with green areas and native wildlife. So for me and the work we're doing at Wakehurst, understanding the connection between biodiversity and nature connectedness will help us design nature-based interventions to improve wellbeing outcomes for, for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorraine. That that was great. That was fascinating about the children, especially about how if they hadn't had any connection, how I suppose it's a bit like sort of taking a drug, isn't it? Um, if you've never had it before, it completely bowls you over. So can everyone turn on their cameras now and have everyone back together? Thank you. Thank you all very much. And so we've got questions coming in. So do start for everybody who's out there putting in more questions for the panel. But um, David Nan, coming back to you, I mean, Given you know the book you wrote about you know what your food ate, I mean how how bad or not bad are the vegetables that you buy in well in your case in Walmart in our case in Tesco's, are they really much worse? Uh, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of studies that have looked at uh, mineral declines in fruits and vegetables over the last eighty years or so the last half century ish. Um, you know the, the real answer is it's highly variable. But, you know, just for the record, we, we tend to buy our, our vegetables from, you know, small producers at farmers markets who we know how they grow them, because that's one of the things we kind of learned in writing what your food ate is just how big a difference the, the health of the soil and farming practices can make to mineral micronutrients, to vitamins, to phytochemicals, and to microbial metabolites, uh, and to what our microbiome then has access to and can create in terms of metabolites for our health. So, you know, it's, it's well worth, you know, if you look at, you know, dietary choices, eating fruits and vegetables is a good one, no matter how they're grown, mm -hmm. but if they're grown in healthy, fertile soil, it's a far better choice, um, is how I would put it. And as usual on these issues, I would defer to Anne. <laughs> okay, Anne. I mean, given that, that for most people who don't have enough money, they tend to, certainly in the Western world, end up in a supermarket rather than at the farm shop. Right. Yeah, I think, I think, Rosie, kind of the answer to that is we really, really want to just steer clear of ultra processed foods, because even if we've got lower levels of, say, the Fab Four in conventional food, what that means is we want to be able to at least take in what is there. Mm -hmm. and, and one way to do that is to kick the ultra processed foods out of the diet because they're displacing these whole foods. So it, it, you know, it's not to say, I mean, if food were so terrible, would there be so many billions of us, you know, all scattered across the planet? You know, I don't want to paint too dire of a picture here, but really, when it comes to dietary choices and incomes and so forth, in some ways, it's getting the stuff out of the diet that's not helping you is kind of step one. And that also means that you have the money that you were previously, you know, perhaps spending on that stuff to start making food choices and food purchases, which are whole foods and that have, you know, you know, they're not completely devoid of the fab four so you're getting that in your diet yeah and if, I, no. if i could jump in with one last of course point on that is that one of the things i was quite surprised to learn in researching growing a revolution was that all the the regenerative farmers that i visited and sort of interviewed and sort of dissected the economics of their farms uh their production costs for food that was more nutrient dense were actually comparable to conventional production costs mm -hmm but they could get a premium for what they grew because there was more demand for it than we're producing. So if we look at the way we subsidize conventional agriculture and actually promote farming practices that are bad for land and bad for us, if we reconsidered that, the price differential mm -hmm. would, would presumably shrink. 
right. yeah, I think that's such a good point. And I mean, thankfully, one of the things where uh, the UK is in the middle of is transitioning the way we subsidize farmers. But, but Kathy, um, all that stuff is just so amazing. You just think, why doesn't every school in the mm. land have a living wall, for instance? Um, mm -hmm. That would be a great use of their limited budgets because you'd get, uh, presumably, you'd also get, I can't remember which one of you, whether it was R Lorraine or you, but talked about concentration, for instance, that when you have that access to greenery, it helps you. How yes. can we make this more part of our lives? Well, I think it, I mean, we need to bring it back into into policy in the same way that, you know, all children should have access to, um, you know, water, clean air, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We should also bring in that all children should have access to green, green nature. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. And the really interesting thing is that a green wall in the club, what they found is going back to the, the point you're making about concentration and um, how well children do in tests. It doesn't matter or doesn't it doesn't affect so much from a socioeconomic background. If you can see green from your classroom window, they did this study, beautiful study in Spain. They showed Every three months, they went back and tested it. Those children that see green from their classroom window did better and better and better in their tests, and their concentrations were better than those looking out onto the brick wall. Now, it wasn't, and they measured the amount of green the children went through on their way to school. And actually, that wasn't the strong relationship. The strong relationship was the fact that they're sitting there in the classroom looking out the window, and it's what they look out the window onto. But green walls in classrooms and the impact of them in terms of cleaning the air as well yeah. as extraordinary. Re the removal of pollutants is really very, very effective. So I think there are small things, but that has to be within sort of school policy. Now, everyone says, oh, there's too much, you know, so much money. But think about how much money we spend on asthma and mm -hmm. how much we spend mm -hmm. on all these other mm -hmm. physical and mental um, health impacts that we could by making one small change bring about a really radical change in the interior environments that children are interacting with on a daily basis that's just that's just wonderful um Marshall, it, it, one of the things that always is difficult with a lot of these issues, part, partly going to the farm shop partly also having nice greenery to see is questions of equality and social justice and you know when you I read a book over the summer called The Heat Will Kill You First that had a lot about like the difference in a city and a heat wave between the, the streets that had lots of trees and the streets that were just concrete. And the difference was 17 degrees. And it was the poor people who lived in the streets that were just concrete. So all the ways round on this, it it's hard to, how, how do we make this not an issue that's just for well-off people? I mean, that is such an important and pertinent question because you're right. Um, it is, you know, looking, thinking of the climate uh, impact of climate change, you know, my home in Trinidad has already had um, much greater impacts than my village here in, in, in England has yet felt. Um, I think it it requires us to face things that are painful and difficult and that we mm -hmm. don't like thinking about <laughs> you know it, requ it requires us to address colonialism essentially and the the ongoing live in real time still present today effects of that and those effects of you know they're they're they're, they're twofold they're, they're still there in the land you know they kind mm -hmm. of industrial agricultural practices that um, Anne and David are talking about, you know, in soil, that kind of farming was born on the plantations in the Caribbean, you know, that kind of real, um, yeah. that, that shift in farming practice. And it's still present in our psyches. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a large part of what's underlying our mental health crises that, that we're experiencing today. So we do just have to pull on, we, do, we just have to, face the hard difficult painful things that we really try to avoid um facing and, and talking about and we've been socialized to avoid pain so I understand why we do it we think that talking about painful subjects is bad that if you go near pain that's terrible but of course pain is this delightful sync signal from our brains and psyches which invites us to turn towards it and attend to it so we can work out what's wrong <laughs> if we ignore pain we never solve what's wrong so i think we really have to together collectively 
look at these painful issues and talk about them. And that's that's the only way that we'll get anywhere. That's such an interesting way to put that, the, the sort of opportunity of pain to open up and look at something that we don't want to look at. Um, I mean, I know that Q have been doing a lot of that sort of looking lately in, in your kind of agenda, Lorraine. And I mean, do you find though when, you know, with children, do they, uh, when they first encounter the nature that you're able to set before them, do they think it's for them or do they think that it's in any way an exclusive commodity? That's a really good question. And unfortunately for quite a lot of the children we work with they don't think it's for them um so particularly with the study i just talked about we worked really really hard and i know that some of my teachers are listening and i'd like to thank them for their work um to bring in um students from schools that wouldn't have connections yeah. or um wouldn't have access to landscapes like wake has and actually we um we saw brilliant results in the research but but those experiences that those children had were so far removed from what is within 15 minutes of their house and the types of landscapes that they can access. Uh, and so we are, yeah, as you can imagine, doing a lot of work with that, looking at um, what can we do? What are the interventions that can be made in urban landscapes? How can we get children to experience different types of habitats and things to give them those experiences and give them access to those experiences? And I think um, Kathy talked about about classrooms, but I think we can go much further. We should be looking at how landscapes are designed, what biodiversity we're putting into landscapes. How are we, is, is it about ecosystems? When we're designing a park, are mm -hmm. we thinking about uh, flat grass we're playing football on, or are we thinking about the ecosystems that people are gonna experience in that space? So yeah, unfortunately, I, the point of your question is, does everyone have access and, and no is the answer. But do you think that after they've been to Wakehurst, they then feel a kind of ownership? A little bit. A little bit, yes. Uh, and it, we have some evidence of that, particularly, again, from uh, those children dragging their parents back. So we track yeah. which of those children said, we have to go and do this again. And we're getting really good uptake from those uh, students and also from the schools that are saying, hold on, we didn't know about this. Can you come to our school and teach us how to do this with our children? So we now have a, a nature connectedness um, uh, uh teacher training program that we're putting together exactly to do that um so yes although those schools that are coming from inner cities just don't have that opportunity and coming to somewhere like Wakehurst even going to somewhere like Kew Gardens which is of course urban and you can access it through free public transport but that's a big commitment for a school it's a commitment in terms of time but also resource um, and so we need to find other ways for those children to be accessing that sort of landscape. Okay, we've got lots and lots of questions, so I'm going to come to them in a minute. But Cathy, do you know anyone who's designing parks where they actually look for the, the the mixture of the biodiversity and stuff like that, rather than just thinking, well, here's the space and here's some flower beds and here's a bit with trees and here's yeah. a bit for football. <laughs> Not not right now. I mean, I, I mean, I'm doing we are doing some work now starting to talk to, you know, because everyone's got different budgets. And also, if you look at people who are planting trees in cities, they have a very, you know, dis distinctive list based on, you know, do they do they, you know, ruin the cars by dropping sort of nasty, sticky mess on the windscreens, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, there is a shift happening and there is there is a really big movement in prescribing nature where people are going being told, you know, that the GP should be or your general practitioner should be able to prescribe. But it's still far too general. It's still just effectively say go and walk in the park for 20 minutes. But it comes back to this actually. But what do you have to have in that park? Because there's a huge difference um, for your 20 minutes in the sort of environment you walk in. Okay, so the first question is a really, it's not the, not actually the first question, but this really interests me. Susan, Hannah, and I've been flicking through them and I can see someone else has asked a slightly similar question. I live by the sea, so there's a huge lack of greenery. What's the unique benefit from the sea? Who wants to pick that up? Because nobody's, um, Anne and David, we haven't heard from you for a little bit, so. I, well, oh. well, since we live in Seattle, uh, I'll basically You by say, the sea, yes. I'll say salmon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I think I saw that question too, Rosie, and I think it gets at the bigger issue that we're all talking about here, which is, now, this is not meant to say research doesn't matter. This is really more meant to say that 
all of this research that we've been discussing here, it's telling us that uh, exposure to nature and time in nature is good for us. And I think marine environments, they are just a different kind of nature. I don't think there's a person alive who hasn't taken a walk along mm -hmm. a beach or been mesmerized by the way that waves break on the sand. That it's a different experience. So I don't, and human beings have been immersed in all kinds of environments. I think about the Inuit in the far north. I mean, they don't have greenery. They got a lot of white snow and frozen ice around them. And so I think there's different, different kinds of nature from which we can reap sort of common benefits. So and maybe it's a case that we just haven't done the research about the sea. I mean, in the way that Kathy's done the research about the plants. There has been some about blue and and seeing blue and seeing oceans and the sound of waves mm -hmm. physiologically and psychologically you have very similar reactions to um certain green landscapes okay well, so really, some people really... say blue green i mean that's you know because there there are these two these two, you know these these are the two environments that really um do trigger and, and i but i agree it's 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 being outdoors but you can bring it indoors as well that's the other point you don't have to be outside to get these benefits and that's really important to remember as we all move into urban landscapes yes well there are some interesting questions someone uh, i'm just trying to find it someone saying about you know growing growing their food indoors um it, it presumably that is also a very good thing to do and also what kind of green walls are the ones that you're talking about Kathy mm -hmm. and how can we create them in our homes that's from Mandy Hannah mm -hmm. Eng R well I mean what I did a bit of researching into these I mean the, the choice of plants just depends on actually what people they, they most of the plants are really really effective so you know you, you find peace lilies you find all sorts of weird things in green walls I keep looking thinking really um but it, it, they seem to all have the, a really powerful way of enhancing the microbiome because they, right. they are actually quite biodiverse but there was a lovely study where they they locked a spider plant in a in a completely clean room sterile room and they went back eight weeks later to find the spider plant's microbiome had basically covered the walls ceilings the door handle the whole lot <laughs> so you don't even need a green wall you just need plants but not the plastic sort. I can't yeah. bear this huge <laughs> number of plastic plants you find on the supermarket shelves now because they don't have the same effect. I mean, you know, no. um, so I think there's a really important point in here about, you know, even if it's six pot plants in your room, that will improve your microbiome in your office. or okay. in your The next question is also for you because I, I think I know the answer, at least I hope I know the answer, is just smelling woodland air doing it. Can it be bottled? Yes. Because I know yes, you're a can. big believer in... <laughs> the types of candles and smells yeah. that you can yeah. have that really can yeah. improve things. It's the volatile organic compounds that are given off by certain um, certain plants. Um, there are certain groups of those that are particularly good. Um, the limonenes, which come from pines, and some of the um, some of the citrus um, ones are really good. The um, the cedrol, which comes from the cedar, and also from things like the Japanese hinoki oil. Those when you in, when you smell those, the really interesting thing is that the many of those compounds, when you breathe them in, you don't just breathe them out again. They pass across the lung membrane, and you find people who've walked in these forests have elevated levels of those those compounds in their blood, mm -hmm. and it lasts for up to seven days after being in the forest. But the really interesting thing is they have elevated levels of these compounds, and they also have elevated levels of natural killer cells in their bloods. And natural killer cells are the, are the compounds that the, the the cells that go for cancers and viruses. And so there's lovely work coming out from Japan and China and South Korea showing this. And these papers are published in things like toxicology, oncology. They're not published in your ecology or biology journals. And so I think it's time that we also joined up the different levels of sciences or different parts of science sciences to really start to understand these chemical interactions with nature and the microbial interactions with nature that we so often are missing and if I say one more thing I mean if we want doctors to prescribe nature we have to give them the same sort of mm -hmm. information they get when they prescribe a drug 
And that is how, you know, what's the dosage? What does it do? How long do you need to take it for? Because the problem is right now it's it's we absolutely should be in nature but if we're going to if we're going to use it as an alternative to drugs we also need to be able to give them a, a quantify it um once again when's your book coming out <laughs> in the summer it's fantastic. called good nature <laughs> fantastic all that stuff hopefully will be revealed um but david and Anne, there's a question here from david mallows who says he's 86 but i have to say i always ask about this thing too when you talk about soil erosion where does it go <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, well the short answer is downhill um the the longer answer is well it really depends on the context there's been some studies uh on erosion in agricultural fields that have suggested that most of the soil just moves a little bit further downhill uh, on this, so it's on the same uh, hillside, say, but on a, a, a conveyor belt moving towards whatever the low spot is, which is usually a stream. And so, if you look at what's happened in terms of erosion in uh, globally, we've ra we've increased the soil erosion rate on farm farm fields by about a factor of ten to a hundred, an order of magnitude or two. But at the same time. That's not making it all the way down to the ocean. Only about uh, we've actually cut the amount of sediment getting to the ocean in half in the same time frame. So where does it all go? It's piling up in reservoirs. It's piling up on floodplains. It's oh, sort of it's, it's in motion, and that's where if we if we think of dirt as soil where we don't want it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you erode soil off an agricultural field and park it on somebody's driveway in a flood or or put it behind a dam, you've turned it into dirt. So. It doesn't just magically disappear, um, but there are lots of people who've done the accounting to try and figure out where it's gone and where it's going. Um, but the real problem is that if it's if it's the source of fertility that we're using to feed ourselves, once we disturb it and move it to a different context, it's no longer helping with that critical mission. Yes, and, and when there's flooding, you always see that the rivers turn incredibly brown with all the soil that they're just taking away from the fields because the farming practices are well that old you know that they're, they're not um no till as you talked about yeah and if, and if you go look at a, a stream draining out of a, a native forest it'll usually be pretty clear yeah um uh, can i come to you marshall there's a question here from maureen college which is really interesting saying we do a lot of walking with groups in the countryside but we worry that the groups are not very diverse i mean i think that's something that a lot of people worry about yes um and I think she was wondering what could be done about it. Um, I would reach out to other communities nearby, really. You know, if there's, is there a church nearby that um, tends to be populated by people from different ethnicity, different background, a mosque, you know, um, are there schools that have a more diverse uh, student population? And just print out some flyers about your walking group and, put them in those spaces, you know, let people know what you're doing and that they would be welcome if they came along to <laughs> your, if they came along to the, to your walking group. So I think there's a, there's a degree of kind of reaching out and extending, extending a welcoming hand because, you know, I was pretty wary <laughs> about being a black woman moving to a village in the countryside. There are not many people like me living in the countryside but I was really spurred on by hearing somebody talking on um, a BBC Oxfordshire I was living in Oxford at the time and she it was one of these little local segments and she talked about how she moved out to a village in the countryside as a black woman and she was really worried about racism but actually she had heard about all these benefits about living in the countryside and green space and what it would do for her health and her mental well-being and she thought this is for me too actually I want this for me too and she took that decision and was loving life. And hearing that made me think, gosh, I could do this. I could do this as well. You know, so um, I, I mean, one way is people like me making ourselves visible, saying that we can do this and that it's possible. But also reach out, reach out to people and mm. let them know that they would be welcome. That's well, really, really nice. I'm, I'm afraid somehow an hour seems to have gone by without me realizing so much time has gone by so it'd just be nice to get a sort of final thought from all of you as to what we can do both as individuals and as communities and indeed you know as a country to use this extraordinary free resource that we have that we've turned our back on and everyone now thinks that pharmaceutical companies can do all the things that you know we think they can do um when you're um Lorraine when you're at Wakehurst I mean do you 
you presumably start you're, you're formulating kind of policies and ideas that can change the future for all of us. Yeah, um, and that is absolutely the impact of our work, hopefully, is, is our connection uh, to DEFRA and our connection to policy and how we can, as Cathy said, really provide the detailed evidence mm. that makes this part of the way we govern our lives. Um, on a more personal basis, I think any time you're outside, notice it. Take a mm. moment just to notice what is around you and it will make a difference to your well-being. Um, I think we often, wherever we are in the world, are walking from A to B, head down, looking at the footpath, trying to get to where we need to go. And just lifting up and looking at the world around us will make a difference. That's really nice. Marshall, what would you say? I mean, I think a lot about relationship <laughs> and I think we can't, you know, we can't get to know what we don't love and we, we can't we can't protect what we don't what we don't love. Um, and so I think we really need to think about our relationship with place. And I think it's something that the relevant professionals need to actually bring into the way that we think about our patients in front of us and, and what impacts mm -hmm. them and what can what can benefit them um, and help people to then notice their relationship with place and change that relationship, develop that relationship into something meaningful. Thank you, Cathy. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think my own journey has changed a lot since researching for this book. I started off by thinking of nature as a sort of this distant thing and um, something academic. And I've become much more, I mean, you should, my house has been transformed. My husband complains bitterly because there's plants everywhere now. <laughs> and we have things puffing smells out and etc. So I think... But does I, it make also, you feel different? It, absolutely. And also, I think you're never too old to actually start to embrace nature. You know, I've always thought of nature as being something that was sort of, you know, either academic or something that, you know, it was a bit of annoyance having to do the garden. I don't mind having mud under my so my fingernails anymore. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, actually I actually embrace that. It's great. Um, and it's all those sorts of things. So I think there's so much and it's it's a good news story. We hear so yeah. much bad news, but there's so much goodness in nature for our health and well-being. And we should just all embrace it from the spider plant right the way through to you know um the, the walking in the park yeah that's really nice i guess it's just always been a kind of western maybe arrogance that somehow we can cut ourselves off from mm. the thing that gave birth to us essentially yeah. and yeah. to which we're so entwined um Anne and david from your seattle um what do you say yeah. to people when they ask you what are the things that they can do to embrace this yeah i I've been sitting here just sort of thinking and taking in everybody's comments and it's kind of striking me that we need a great remembering. And, and what I mean by that is I think that we have in our bodies and in our minds and from our parents and grandparents, this innate inherent part of human biology that knows how we feel when we are out in nature and that if there was some kind of, you know, a, a movement to remind us all that this exists inside of us and it doesn't cost us, you know, a dime to go out and take a walk somewhere if, you know, to, to points made here that um, we need to build these kinds of places and preserve these kinds of places in our built and natural environments. So in some ways, this great remembering is is maybe the planet's you know biggest unknown conservation project, which is, hey, let's use our innate inherent biology because we are indeed a part of nature. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was lovely. And thank you all, Lorraine and David, Marshall and Kathy. That was a wonderful evening. Um, go online and check out what we've got coming next because we've got some other great events coming up with uh, with Q and with Rathbones in the next couple of months. Um, Andrea Wolf, um, Am uh, Amitav Ghosh, um, some amazing speakers, and we look forward to seeing you then. And thank you all very much to you at home. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but I know some of the speakers have typed in answers. Anyway, thank you again, and good night to you all. Good night. <laughs>